Hi, I'm Alex Udris, and thanks for joining us tonight for Bold Method Live IFR. We're talking about approach names and equipment requirements, how the two are kind of linked. Uh, we've got Corey Komarek today in chat handling questions, and Colin Cutler is our technical director. And the topic today uh, came from questions from feedback during the last show. Uh, and I know approach naming conventions sound pretty basic, uh, but the problem is they can kind of confuse us when it comes to equipment requirements, especially DME and distance equipment. I don't know, some of you are going, dude, DME's dead. No one ever uses DME anymore. Everything's RNAV based. Well, wait till you get into a transport category airplane. DME is still alive and well there right now. And you'll find quite a few cases uh, where you can be flying along with zero RNAV information or GPS information, and all you've got is VHF and DME. So DME is still uh, you know, really important, not just as a backup, but as a piece of equipment you're gonna find on quite a few different aircraft. So we'll start by just talking about approach names and what the name means. Okay, and we'll also get into uh, the Z's, X's, Y's, ABC's. We'll talk about straight in and circling naming conventions, but we'll talk about the equipment and the name. And then from there, we're going to talk about the notes section and understanding where equipment requirements are written on the chart. We're gonna look at both Jepson charts tonight and we're gonna look at the two different formats of FAA charts. The FAA about 2019 started to change its equipment require or uh, its equipment format. They've got a new section on the chart, which a lot of people don't know about. So we'll show an example of that as well. Um, and so to dive in, let's just start talking about approach names. And the first approach we're gonna show um, is the most basic and it's a circling approach. So uh, we'll jump over to the iPad. What you can see here, this is the VOR alpha into, that is a small arrow, there we go, into North Bend, Oregon. Uh, most of you who've seen an approach chart know that the name for the chart is shown on the header section at the very top. And just simply looking at this procedure, what we know about it is that it's a circling procedure and that it's based off of VOR system. So what's this tell us? Well, the name of the approach, VOR, is based off the VHF, or not the VHF, but the navigation system that provides guidance on the final approach segment. And then the alpha here indicates that this is a circling approach. And the first circling approach of the VOR type to the North Bend Airport. And of course, if we go down to the minimum section, you'll see that there are no straight in minimums listed. There are just circle to land minimums listed for this procedure. So circling approaches, as opposed to stating uh, the runway number, they'll start with A, the first approach of that cir or circling approach of that type to the airport, and then they'll start counting up. And again, the type is based off the nav aid that provides guidance on the final approach segment. And again, you could find, like for example, you look at procedures that might use uh, VOR to get you onto a localizer or RNAV to get you onto the localizer. If the localizer is the thing that provides lateral guidance on final approach, then the procedure is named LOC, even though you may require VOR or other equipment to navigate it. Okay, going back to the iPad, let's stay with North Bend and we're gonna take a look at another procedure there. I'll zoom in. So this is the VOR DME Bravo into North Bend, Oregon. So same airport. Again, it's a circling procedure because of the B. It's the second circling procedure of this type, of the VOR type that brings us into North Bend. And if we go down to the minimum section, again, you'll notice there are no straight in, to, uh, straight in minimums published for the airport. There are only circle to land minimums. And I'm just gonna bring this up really quickly because this ends up being a super common question. Uh, the question that I hear oftentimes is, if I was landing on this runway right here, if I wanted to land here, could I essentially kind of fly a straight in? Absolutely. When we say that it's circling only minimums, that does not mean that you need to fly a pattern or circle in any way, shape, or form. It just means that the procedure does not meet the requirements for straight in landing minimums. Either the MDA is too high uh, or the runways are aligned outside of 30 degrees. There are other criteria as well, a little less common, but you can take the most efficient and safe route to the runway threshold. And sometimes it still feels 
fairly straight in. Okay, so again, circling approaches, it's gonna be the type of equipment that provides navigation on the final approach, and then dash alpha for the first circling approach of that type, dash bravo for the second circling approach of that type. And again, people see the DME in there, they go, well, that's different, but not really in the FAA's eyes. In fact, the fact that DME shows up in the approach name at all has really become almost arbitrary. Uh, and it, you can't rely on it to tell you anything about the procedure. You'll see approaches that don't have DME in there that require distance information. We're gonna really dig in on that in a second because it is incredibly confusing. And the approach naming conventions have changed over time. So when you're looking at approaches and you see you know, DME or equipment in the titles, keep in mind, you know, if that approach was named 10 years ago, the, the conventions then are a little bit different than the conventions now. Okay, so now let's go to the opposite side, uh, a straight in approach. And we're gonna take a look at an RNAV procedure here. Again, I'm gonna zoom in on the header. And again, well, this is a Jeppesen chart. Um, this is the exact same uh, for FAA procedures as, all, as well. They use the same name. This is the RNAV Zulu Runway 9 into Telluride, Colorado. The GPS in the parentheses is really there for the pilot, not part of the procedure name, okay? And so um, when you're cleared for this procedure by ATC, they will not say the part in the parentheses. All they care about is that the name is the RNAV Zulu to Runway 9. Um, what GPS says is this is an RNAV procedure. In fact, it's an RMP or required navigation, navigation, navigation performance procedure. That's what RMP stands for, required navigation performance. But this procedure can be accomplished with GPS and does not require special aircrew authorization. Basically means if your aircraft is equipped with a suitable RNAV system, which in general is GPS and you have an instrument certificate and rating and are qualified to fly the airplane, then you can fly that procedure. Okay, the Zulu here means that there are multiple approaches, straight in approaches using RNAV to runway nine. If there was only one RNAV procedure to runway nine that was straight in, it would just be RNAV GPS runway nine. Okay, but because we see the Zulu, that means that there's another RNAV straight in procedure to runway nine. And it's gonna count backwards. So it's, it's gonna go from Zulu, Yankee, X-ray. Um, You'll never find 26 or even close to that at an airport, so it's really easy to tell when you look at the title. You see A, B, C, circling approach. You see Z, Y, X, now you know you're getting multiple straight-in procedures for the airport. And I always tell people, uh, sometimes we're kind of in a rush to, to choose an instrument procedure, just simply because workload can get high. Um, but if you ever see, you should always look at all the procedures for the airport quickly. You know, quite a few of them you can disqualify right away, get to the lowest minimums. But especially when you see multiple straight-in approaches to a runway using the same system, read them all because the differences, uh, differences can be really important. And we'll take a look at that here. Uh, so this is the RNAV GPS Zulu. And if we take a look, Telluride also has an RNAV GPS Yankee Runway 9. Again, when ATC clears you, they do not say GPS. They're just simply gonna call it RNAV Yankee to Runway 9. So when we take a look at that, um, really you have to examine the chart to tell what's different here. So one of the first things you'll notice is this procedure has three different landing minima. It's got a localizer performance lateral only minima uh, at 11,500 feet decision, or, uh, MDA, minimum descent altitude. It has an LNAV MDA uh, with a note at 11.9, and then it has a second LNAV MDA at 12,140. And if we look at that note, that flag right there, number one, missed approach requires a minimum climb of 380 feet per nautical mile to 12,500 feet. Okay, so what that means is if you use this set of minima right here, you need that 380 foot per nautical mile climb to 12.5. If you use this LP minima here or the higher LNAV minima here, this note doesn't apply. And if we look at the chart's general notes, you'll notice it doesn't say anything about climb gradient here. So essentially, going back to the minima, 
What that means is you need to be able to make 200 feet per nautical mile here, 200 feet per nautical mile here, and here you would need to make 380 feet per nautical mile. Okay, the lowest you can get here is with LP guidance down to 11.5. The other thing to note, uh, and this will become important in a second, you'll notice your altitude to set by here is 13,000 feet. Okay, so if we now go back to that Zulu approach, Let's see, give me one second. First of all, you'll notice a note right here in the mist approach section itself. Mist approach requires a minimum climb of 380 feet per nautical mile to 12,500 feet. If unable to meet the climb gradient, you see the RNAV GPS Yankee runway nine. Okay, so again, um, this entire procedure requires 380 feet per nautical mile, all minima do. And if you go down to the bottom, there's only one minima published here. It's the LP. It gets you down a little lower to 10,640, 10,640 feet. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that your minimum altitude going into SEPMA is 100 feet lower. It's 12,900 feet. And so that's why they use two separate procedures as opposed to one procedure with four different lines of minima. Essentially, because that altitude into SEPMA is different, and that's the only difference outside of the minima on those two procedures. They needed to publish two different charts. Uh, and so I always tell people, when you're seeing those multiple straight in, you really want to try to pay attention to the differences. Make sure you can identify them and pick the one that doesn't necessarily get you down the lowest, but that's the most appropriate for your airplane. You know, maybe you can make 430 feet per nautical mile, and it's still pretty close to 380. I would choose the one with the 200 foot per nautical mile climb gradient. You saw Telluride, that's the uh, uh, film at the beginning actually of the VFR course. It's a pretty tight missed approach procedure and the terrain rises really fast. See, you'd hate to be below that required climb gradient. Okay, looks like we've got our first question. Uh, we do, and you did a pretty good job answering it, so I modified it just a little bit. Um, and the question is, do the differences between Z and Y approaches always have to do with the missed approach climb performance? They don't. Um, and, and we'll look at a couple other procedures as well, actually. So all that the, when we look at Z, Y, X, we start going back um, again. What we're doing is we're saying there is some difference in the procedure. What that difference is, you'll have to look at the chart to find out. Um, however, missed approach, uh, missed approach climb gradients and step down, step down altitudes are a really common reason that you would end up with multiple procedures or multiple procedures of the same type. Uh, but the most common reason, um, and most of these you'll find are RNAV. Uh, when you look at X, Y, Z named straight end procedures, they're almost always RNAV procedures. In fact, I don't remember seeing any when I learned to fly uh, in 97, 98, 99 before we really had RNAV procedures. Um, and so let's take a look I'm going to move forward here to Rifle. Uh, Rifle Colorado is an airport many people end up to end up at uh, without ever really wanting to go there. Uh, if you're ever able to charter yourself into Aspen, uh, what you really find half the time is that you charter into Rifle. And that's because Aspen is a very difficult airport to land um, because they oftentimes have a tailwind. It's really looked at as a one way in, one way out airport. You land on runway 15, you take off on runway 33. The problem is if the tailwind on runway 15 is more than 10 knots, most operators can't land there and they can't fly the pattern in the Aspen Canyon. Uh, pistons can. We're a little slower and it's a little easier if the winds are fairly light, you know, 10 or 15 knots, no big deal. Uh, but turbine operators can't. So if you're flying a charter flight into Aspen and you end up with more than a 10 knot tailwind on runway 15, chances are you're not going to land at Aspen. Uh, the other airports in the area are Eagle and Vail. Uh, uh, sorry, Vail, Eagle, and Rifle. And Rifle is usually where people divert. It's a little shorter drive from Rifle into Aspen. So if you talk to people who fly into Aspen a lot, uh, they'll tell you half the time, you're really going to Rifle. Okay, and that's why when you look at Rifle, we've got a couple different procedures here. Again, um, this is an RNAV procedure, RNP, Zulu, to runway 8. Okay, so what's RNP mean? Well, 
We already said that GPS is still RNP. All RNP means is required navigation performance. That means that your system can measure and determine that it is meeting a required navigation performance standard. Okay, and GPS or nav can do that. So what's the difference? Well, the names kind of kind of obfuscates the real meaning and it gets very confusing. But what they're saying here is this is an authorization required approach. Okay, it is still an RNAV approach. It's an RNP approach, just like a basic GPS approach. But this procedure requires both special aircraft and aircrew qualification requirements. So it's a special authorization required approach. Uh, and because of that, you need special equipment to fly it. Uh, you need special training to fly it. It is typically limited to both airline and then kind of the larger, newer uh, corporate aircraft operations. So um, GA aircraft, light GA aircraft like a Cirrus, you're probably not going to be approved to fly that RNP procedure. But again, when you look at it, when people go, what's the difference between RNAV GPS and RNAV RNP? They are both RNAV procedures. They both require RNP. The difference is when it says RNAV RNP, it requires special aircraft and aircrew qualification and authorization. And so generally, again, you're talking about business jets that are approved and trained, and you're talking about airline operators in fairly new equipment typically that are approved to fly those. Okay, so looking at this, we have an RNAV RNP Zulu to runway eight. And if we go to the next procedure, here we have an RNAV GPS Yankee to runway eight. So again, um, in my mind, this is the most common reason we see Zulu, Yankee, um, and it's usually just Zulu and Yankee. I rarely see an x-ray, but it happens. It's because one of the two, it may be the Z, it may be the Y. One of the two is an RNP authorization required procedure, and the other one is just a basic RNP GPS or RNAV GPS procedure. Um, the next thing, the last thing to say about that quickly here is remember when ATC is clearing you, they're not going to say RNP, they're not going to say cleared for the RNAV RNP Yankee, or they're just simply going to say cleared for the RNAV Yankee or cleared for the RNAV Zulu. In fact, they don't know whether you're qualified to fly it or not. They don't even know the differences most of the time. To them, it's just two different procedures. It's up to you as the pilot to determine whether you meet the requirements to fly those procedures. Okay, uh, looks like we got another question. Uh, Jim Basford has a question. Going back to the Telluride approaches, um, and I just I thought this would be a good chance to hop in here. He says, how come you need to uh, a higher climb on the LNAV than on the LPV, but you're going lower on the LPV approach? Very good question. Um, essentially, let's pull up that, I'm going to pull up that Telluride procedure for you. So, when you look at that, we basically have three sets of minimums and they're climbing each time. We have localizer performance at 11,500 feet. We have LNAV performance with a 380 feet per nautical mile climb gradient uh, on the mist at 11.9, so 400 feet higher. And then we have a basic LNAV, uh, which is using 200 feet per nautical mile in the mist approach climb gradient. And that goes up another 240 feet. So it's 12,140. What's the difference? The difference is the tolerances or the precision that you'll be flying at on this procedure. A LP procedure is a localizer performance. So LP minimums require your GPS or RNF system to give you localizer performance guidance. So essentially, the RNAV signal will give you the same precision that a loc only procedure would have. So when you see, we talk about, you know, people see LPV. Uh, that's localizer performance with vertical guidance, essentially an ILS. If you see LP by itself, it means localizer performance without vertical guidance. And so essentially you're just flying a basic loc approach. This isn't because it's a failback. It's not because guidance wasn't available because the satellites weren't there or your system couldn't do it. It's because terrain prevented, or some reason, in this case terrain, prevents you from using vertical guidance down to a decision altitude. That's why they can only uh, publish a localizer performance minimum. LNAV, if we go back to the uh, chart, LNAV is a much wider tolerance. So the way you can kind of look at this, and I'm gonna 
kind of fake this a little bit because obviously it's kind of hard to, uh, I don't know exactly what the tolerances are, but we'll, we'll say LNAV is kind of this blue area here. You know, it might use a tolerance like that, okay? But LPV, on the other hand, is going to use a tolerance, or sorry, LP, is going to use a tolerance much more like that. So now, when we're flying an LNAV-only procedure, um, we could be anywhere inside this area. We could be here or here, and you know we're still showing CDI deflection. Um, whereas with an LP-only procedure, it's going to keep the aircraft in a much tighter window as it flies in. And so because of that, we essentially can reduce that obstacle clearance area. So, you know, because we know the airplane's going to be in a most, more precise uh, position, we can tighten up our obstacle clearance areas, and that typically results in lower minimum descent altitudes. So that's why when you look at it, um, so the, the question that you may ask about why does the higher climb gradient apply? Uh, because they know where you're going on an LP. They know exactly where you're going to be as you execute the missed approach procedure. They don't need as wide of an area to counter uh, for terrain on the missed approach. On the LNAV, um, you could be in a much larger amount of area as you start that missed approach, and so therefore they need a larger terrain clearance plane. And so what they're saying is two things. Well, we'll let you go down if you got the climb performance because you'll be able to make it up in time. Otherwise, we're going to keep you up a little bit higher so that we know you can clear the terrain. It comes down to knowing where you are. Okay, um, so wrapping up the beginning of the name section, right? When we see ABC, most people know that's a circling procedure, maybe multiple circling procedures to the airport of a type, so that it go B, uh, C. When we have straight end procedures that are named Zulu, um, Yankee, or X-ray, those are multiple straight end procedures using the same basic final approach navigation type, VOR, localizer or ILS, um, RNAV, whether it's RNAV GPS or RNAV RNMP. Um, and the differences between charts could be things like one procedure's authorization required, RNAV RNP. It could be that one procedure requires uh, a different step down uh, or requires different missed approach procedures or climb gradients. So you really have to look at the charts to figure it out. Okay. Here's a really sticky point. This is the one we get the most questions on. When is DME required and when isn't it? So everybody's looked at a procedure. You look at the name, it says ILS or LOC, and then you look at the chart and it says DME required. And then you look at another chart and it says ILS or LOC DME. Okay, so why didn't they just put DME in the name on the first chart? You might see a VOR procedure. It says VOR, you look in the notes, it says DME required. And you see another procedure to the same airport, it says VOR DME. Okay, so it's like, why do we put DME in the name sometimes and why don't we? And the, the policy is starting to change. Right now, the FAA's policy is to only include the final approach nav aid that provides lateral guidance on final approach. And DME doesn't really provide lateral guidance, it's just distance information. So you're seeing DME included less and less on procedure names. And what it really means is when you want to understand what equipment is required for a procedure, you need to look at the notes, uh, both in the notes section and on the plan view and also in the procedure's name. And then you should look at each fix and identify, okay, how am I gonna identify this? What are my legal ways of identifying this? Okay, so to kind of get into that, um, the example that I've got here, we're going to start with is uh, the ILS or localizer to runway two in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And again, you could look at this procedure and say, it doesn't say anything about DME up here. Okay, it just says ILS or localizer. So if I've got an ILS or localizer receiver, I should be able to fly this. But as we dig into the chart, this is a Jepson chart, you can see Right here, it says DME required. I'll switch to the highlighter. DME is required. Okay, then there's some other notes about the visual glide slope indicator. If we look here, we also see that DME is required. And then it says it's also required for procedure entry from the in route environment. Okay, so if a piece of equipment 
is required for entry to the procedure from the in route environment. Both Jepson and the FAA will normally publish that in the plan view. We'll look at the same chart, the FAA version, in a second. But again, when we talk about the plan view, it says overhead view. You'll usually see that there. And again, when we talk about procedure entry from the in route environment, what we're saying is you're going to need DME or suitable distance information, like RNAV GPS distance information, to get from the initial approach fix to final approach. That's what they're saying. The reason we need to differentiate that is because if ATC can give you a vector to final, then you may not end up actually needing that because you don't need to enter the procedure from the in route environment. ATC can put you on it. But essentially, when you see that, that plan view note, the, the important part there is the FA is trying to tell you, you need this to either join the initial approach fix or recognize the initial approach fix or navigate an intermediate or initial approach segment somehow to get yourself lined up with final. But the other problem is if you look at this, you know, you could say, well, if I'm flying an ILS, okay, I could get vectored on, don't need DME or distance information then. Duma is my final approach fix. And on an ILS, I can count my final approach fix at glide slope intercept at the published intercept altitude, so 7,800 feet. So I could say I can recognize my final approach fix because I've now intercepted the ILS glide slope. I'm gonna take that down to the decision altitude. That is my missed approach point. So this published missed approach point here does not apply for an ILS. That is for LOC only. Okay, so in an ILS, I'm gonna take it down to DA. At DA, I'm gonna start my climb out. I never needed any sort of distance information here whatsoever. Unless you look at our missed approach instructions. And if you look at the ZDAN fix, okay, it's on a Santa Fe 354 degree radial, 30 DMA from Santa Fe. The only way to identify the missed approach holding fix in this case is either to have an RNAV database and navigate it that way, or to have DME information. So that's why DME is required for the entire procedure. In this case, DME is required for entry from the in route environment. You really don't need it on final approach at all if you're flying the ILS because you can simply use DA and glide slope intercept to navigate that, but then you would need it again for the missed approach procedure. Okay. Um, and again, the entire time you'll notice it never said that DME was required in the procedures title. And that's one of the things um, that when we're, we're looking at procedures, don't use the name to figure out whether you need DME. Okay. Uh, the FAA plate, you'll notice chart, so they're not plates, you'll notice, whoo, that's big. That's big. That's big. <laughs> okay, uh, you'll notice it says DME required period in this notes section. And it says DME required in the plan view. Again, this DME required indicates that you need DME to start the procedure to transition from the in route environment to the final approach course. And if you look at this, it makes sense. We've got HEGME, which is a DME arc. Uh, we got ECSISA, which is another DME arc. So again, you need distance information for both of those. Um, you will notice we could use cross radials to identify a variety of fixes here. Um, but you, so FAKER is an intersection, you could use radial 220. Uh, SIBVU is an intersection, you could use radial 232. Duma is an intersection, you could use radial 261. So each of these fixes could be defined by cross radials from the Santa Fe VOR. But um, if you look at the Lear initial approach fix, you would actually need DME to identify it. It's a 17 DME point on radial 232. And if you look at the in route chart, what you'll actually find is that there's a Victor Airway that comes along here. This fix here is not an intersection that you can use a cross rail to define. The only way you'll know you're there is either with RNAV or with DME. So that's why the DME required to enter the procedure for the in route environment is here. And then again, it's up here because we need it for the missed approach procedure to identify ZDAN as well. Okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, so Alex wants to know this. Uh, with regard to the FAA charts, is there one single place you can identify the DME requirements on the FAA charts, or do you need to scan the whole chart to figure it out? Alex, it, it would make sense that you would have one single place, but the answer is we're getting there. 
Um, the FAA has realized in 2019 that that would be a really good idea. And so they're starting to add a box that identifies equipment requirements. But the long and the short of it is very few charts have been issued since that point. It is going to take years until the FAA charts are updated. So you really need to scan the entire chart and know what you're looking for. Again, plan view, entry from the in route environment, uh, notes section, um, and, and up in the header for maybe final approach and for missed approach procedure. And of course, the procedure title. If the procedure title says you need DME for it, then you need distance information there as well. I have an example of the new one, and I'm going to pull that one up in just a second. Uh, but it looks like we get another question. Okay, one more, more we'll throw in here, and that's from Jim, and he says, can you use GPS to substitute for DME on all of these that we've looked at so far? Great question. Absolutely, as long as you're flying with an appropriately certified uh, GPS RNAV system. So um, TSO 129, the old school GPS, basic GPS, can substitute for uh, distance information. And TSO 146, the new WAS GPS requirements and kind of the similar ones can also substitute for distance information. Uh, so how do you know if your, your unit is appropriately certified? The answer is you look in the airplane's flight manual. There'll be a supplement uh, for that RNAV system if it was not factory installed. That supplement will have the limitations in the front. Those limitations will tell you what the certification basis is, and that's how you figure out what you can do with it. Uh, but in general, an appropriately certified uh, RNAV system can be used to identify named fixes, VORs, NDBs, compass locators, and it can be used to measure your distance from named fixes, VORs, NDBs, compass locators, and it can use to you can use it to navigate to and from named fixes, VORs, NDBs, compass locators. Uh, the one thing that you cannot use an RNAV system for, RNAV cannot substitute for a localizer. Um, so if you're ever flying a procedure, final approach or not, along a localizer course, uh, and you have to navigate that localizer, RNAV cannot substitute for a localizer. You need to fly green needles or with raw basic localizer data. Okay, um, so we looked at Santa Fe there. Um, I wanna show another example of why you can't always trust that procedure name. Um, and so we'll take a look at Rock Springs here. Uh, this is the Rock Springs VOR to Runway 9. I've got a uh, FAA chart. Um, and, what you, and it's got the new information box on it. So first of all, you can see this is the VOR to Runway 9. The procedure title says nothing about DME required. Um, the new box, I'll start with that, is right here. The new equipment box is right here above the notes section. You can see there's this little thin box right here, and it says DME required. Okay, so it is now separate from the actual procedure notes. It sits on top of the procedure notes. It needs to be a newly charted procedure. It could be a revision or amendment, but it needs to be a newly charted procedure for this to be shown. And so what they're telling you here is that DME is required. So really, even though the name doesn't say it, this is a DME required procedure. And if we look at it, it makes sense for a couple reasons. Uh, we have a DME arc and another DME arc that transition us onto the procedure. Um, when we come down to actually look at the profile view, you'll notice that the final approach fix is a DME uh, intersection or a DME fix. It's nine miles, uh, the name is Inuxi, so nine miles here from the Rock Springs OCS, uh, OCS VOR. You can see OCS right there. Um, and so again, even though the procedure title never says anything about DME, in this case, you would need DME or a suitable RNAV system, and it makes sense. You would never be able to identify the final approach fix on this procedure. Okay, so now let's take a look at the three different chart formats that you're going to see, uh, and we're going to use two different uh, ILS approaches into Albuquerque. Um, and they're, we're going to look at both of the FAA versions, and so you're going to see how one of the old FAA charts has kind of the notes all over the place, and one of the new FAA charts has the notes organized on the top, and then I've got a Jepson chart in there as well. Again, the point here is to kind of learn where to look for the equipment requirements on the procedure. 
So we're going to start with the Albuquerque ILS uh, or Loke to runway eight. And we zoom in. This uses the new FAA equipment format. ILS or Loke to runway eight. It is not mentioned DME anywhere in the title. However, when we look at the equipment requirements box, DME required, period. That means you need DME. RNAV1, GPS, or radar required for procedure entry. Okay, so what they're saying here is DME is required for this procedure no matter what. However, RNAV1 or GPS is required only, or radar is required to get you some from the in route environment, environment onto the final approach course. So that could be the initial approach fix, uh, the initial approach segment, intermediate fixes, or the intermediate segment. When we look at that, you can see why. Quite a few of our initial approach fixes here are RNAV waypoints. Uh, that's what the kind of star means. These aren't intersections. These are actually RNAV waypoints. Um, one here. Let's see. One here. Uh, and I think that's our only uh, initial approach fix. And then again, on this case, if you look at the missed approach procedure, climb to 5,800. Then a climbing right turn to 8,000 direct to Albuquerque, Vortec, and hold. We don't need DME for the missed approach procedure um, because you could identify the VOR from station passage. Um, but the FAA says you need it for both Giselle. We have a DME fix there. Um, the visual descent point here, uh, which is loc only. And then um, you can see the missed approach point on a localizer procedure. Okay, now let's take a look at an older plate chart. This is the ILS or LOC to runway three. And again, I pulled both of these out of the current uh, terminal procedures packet on four flight. So both of these are valid right now. These are both the charts that you would get. Uh, again, doesn't mention anything about DME. If you look in the notes section, there's no DME listed here, no equipment requirements. And again, then when we look down at the plan view, you can see it says DME or radar required. Again, that means that DME or radar required uh, for entry from the in route environment. So again, when you see that note here, they're implying you need it to enter from the in route environment. And it makes sense. Node me, no DME. Um, kind of ironic. Is the initial approach fix <laughs> on the arc? Um, and then you can see here, Comro, you, they'll, they note on this one, GPS required. It's an RNAV waypoint, so that makes sense uh, to enter from this point. Uh, radar would be radar vectors, or they could tell you when you cross the fixes. Um, and then if you looked at the missed approach procedure, um, I'll zoom in a little bit. Climb to 5,900 feet, then a climbing left turn to 8,000 feet direct to the Albuquerque Vortac and hold. So in this case, the missed approach procedure, you wouldn't actually need DME on it at all. Um, and so that's why they say it's only required for entry from the in route environment. Okay, and last but not least, I'm gonna show you the ILS or LOC3 in the JEP format. Again, this is the current version of the chart, so it's the same information shown just a little bit differently. Again, the procedure name is the exact same, ILS or localizer to runway three. And again, if we go down to the plan view, radar or DME required for procedure entry from the in route environment. So again, both Jeppesen and the FAA uh, put that DME required block in the plan view. And then you can see from that Comro fix, they put a note, GPS required right there, so that you know that this is an RNAV fix. Um, okay, looks like we got another question. Okay, Daniel's got a question. Going back to that VOR approach in Rock Springs, uh, with the v and his question is this, with the VOR approach DME is required, can GPS DME be used? Great question. Um, so absolutely, DME, uh, GRNAV, a suitable RNAV system, which means an appropriately certified RNAV system, can always substitute for DME, always. Uh, it doesn't make a difference whether it's on the final approach course or on the missed approach course or the initial approach fix, in route, terminal, RNAV can always substitute for distance information. Um, what RNAV cannot do is replace the final approach course guidance. So what that means is 
Um, you cannot exclusively use RNAV to fly the final approach of this VOR procedure. So if we look at it, I'm going to go down to the profile view here. Final approach on this procedure starts at the final, oof, starts at Inuxi. That's our final approach fix. Okay. And then it carries us into our missed approach point of OCS. Okay. To navigate the lateral final approach, left and right, we need to have VOR information. You cannot use RNAV to replace the final approach nav aid. Um, there's a caveat there. Uh, and the caveat is this. If it's a VOR procedure, you can still use RNAV to run your autopilot flight director CDI on your HSI. You can still have that connected to RNAV as long as you are monitoring the VOR's data and your position uh, relative to the VOR. And that's in the AIM. It's also in the advisory circulars that talk about RNAV substitution. So what that basically saying is, hey, we're probably using RNAV to get ourselves onto this procedure most likely. And yes, on final approach, you cannot replace the VOR with RNAV. You must have the VOR up, tuned, identified, it's working, and you must watch your position. But you don't have to strap it to your primary indicator. You can still leave that on RNAV. The way I do this is I simply leave my bearing pointer on the VOR. So I always am monitoring my position using the bearing pointer on my electronic HSI with the G1000, and I'm leaving my CDI tied up to RNAV, so CDI is still guiding my autopilot flight director. It's much safer uh, because RNAV provides much better guidance. Um, you don't get the cone of confusion and zone of ambiguity. You don't get coarse scalloping. You don't get all the problems that you can get with VOR interference in terrain, which, believe it or not, happens more often than you think. Uh, the other thing is I don't have to switch autopilot modes and swap CDIs as much. So you can use RNAV as long as you're monitoring VOR in that final approach course. You cannot ever use RNAV to replace a localizer course. So if the final approach uses a localizer or any other segment of the approach or missed approach uses a localizer, you cannot legally use RNAV to laterally navigate that course. Your main CSI or CDI, your HSI needs to be tied to the localizer itself. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, Scott's got a question about uh, notes sections and he says this, I've flown an approach with a note in the plan view that reads procedure NA for arrivals at a particular fix on a particular heading. However, I'm often given that exact same heading to the fix by ATC. Does ATC supersede that instruction? I've never heard of that happening before. No. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about why that happens. And actually, I'm going to quickly thumb through until I find one of these so you can understand what's going on here. Oh, perfect. Let's take a look at the ILS or LOC runway 2. And it says... Procedure not authorized for arrivals at Lirier on Victor 66, 611 southwestbound. There you go, Victor 611 southwestbound. So where is Lear? Okay, it's right here. Here's the rule. Uh, and it, it changes based off of RNAV or traditional VHF procedures. Um, on a VHF procedure, VOR, ILS, LOC, NDB, if you find one of those, your traditional ground-based nav -A procedures. The turn that you make from your arrival to the initial approach fix onto the initial approach segment cannot exceed 120 degrees. What they're figuring is if the turn is larger than that, you're gonna fly outside of an area or you may not be able to get established on the initial approach segment in enough time to allow yourself to descend and navigate the segment. So essentially, when you see that procedure NA for an arrival, it's because that airway or that heading or whatever it is, is going to give you more than a 120 degree turn onto that initial approach segment. So let's say ATC assigns one of those to you. What's going on? Well, first of all, you can always query them. They may say, that's fine. No, nope, you're, you're, you know, you're good, go ahead and fly that heading. They may be providing maybe ob obstruction, you know, uh, monitoring and clearance so that you know, they know that you can make that turn. Um, however, it oftentimes does result in a long turn onto the initial approach segment. And so it oftentimes is better to ask them for a vector out. And um, they can vector you out a little bit and then give you direct to that fix. 
Um, and if you've got RNAV capability or you can still navigate to that fix, that makes the turn much easier. I've made that mistake uh, on an RNAV procedure um, going into Cortez, Colorado. Um, and let me just pull it up really quick. I'm going to pull it up in four flight. I think it's a Zulu, right, Colin? Uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's the one right there. Okay. Yeah, we were coming in from uh, going so, to either Havu or Dolar, one of the two. We were. And um, in this case, there wasn't a restriction on it, um, but I was coming in here, um, and it resulted in a really aggressive turn. Um, I think I was going into Havu. It re re uh, required a really aggressive turn. Um, and when you see these notes here on RNAV procedures, the limit is 90 degrees as opposed to 120. Um, but really what happened is the turn took so long that by the time I got established, I couldn't actually make myself get down to the low altitudes on each or the lowest altitudes on each of the segments. And um, I, I would have had to pull the throttle idle. It was a winter day. Couldn't keep the engine warm. Uh, it just took too long. Uh, and so... ATC had actually offered me a box vector to reduce my turn, and I refused it. Didn't work out well for me. I, I ended up going missed even before the final approach fix. Um, and so came back around and did it at a lower altitude, you know, because to join that Cortez approach, we're basically bombing over the mountains. You're, you're dropping down from the mountains uh, that go up to 14.5. Um, so when you do see that note, on a VHF ground-based procedure, it's a 120-degree turn limit. That's why that's published. On an RNAV procedure, it's a 90-degree turn limit, turn limit. And the reason they justify that is they're saying, hey, RNAV gives us the ability to get you in from a variety of different directions. We're not restricted to all these ground fixes that we used to be. So we should give you a smaller turn to make it easier as the pilot. And if you find that you're going to need to turn in excess of those numbers, 120 or 90, if it's above the procedure NA, Ask ATC for a box vector or vector out so that your turn is a little bit less. Makes it easier on you as a pilot. Okay, next question. Okay, we've got time for one last question tonight, and it comes from Chris. And it's a good question that uh, I think you are very suited to answer, and that is, what iPad are you running, and does it fit in the cockpit using ForeFlight, or does it get in the way? Um. I have an iPad Pro with the, what's the 12.9 inch? Or? Yeah, I think it's 12.9 is the not, size. I carry it with me in the airplane. I The Cirrus SR22 Turbo has got a nice size cockpit. I normally fly from the right side, which I actually feel is even a little roomier. Um, I think that's just because the panel's not right in front of me. Um, that being said, the 12.9 is way too big for me to actually be, a, be able to maneuver around in the cockpit. So I would absolutely not get the, the large iPad Pro for the cockpit. Uh, this is what I use. It's uh, in the airplane. It's uh, the older iPad Pro. Um, what is it, the 10 point? It's like 10. I think that's like just over 10 inches. Just and over 10 inches. Yeah, yeah. now they, they still have two sizes of iPad Pro, and the, the new iPad Air is also, very. it's either 9.7 or it's that size. It's very similar. A lot of people like the minis, and I can say that the mini is possibly one of the, you know, it's small, it's super portable, um, it's really easy to fit into a cockpit. That being said, I kind of like the larger screen real estate. Um, the cockpits I fly in are at least big enough that they, they can support it. Um, so I really like that kind of 10-inch form factor that the iPad Pro 10-inch has. Uh, I really like the pencil. Um, I actually wish it, I would get the new one uh, with the new pencil um, if I was recommending it, it today. I know it is significantly more expensive. The old pencil you have to plug in from the bottom to charge, it is a pain in the butt. Uh, the new one, you can just clip it to the top and it charges magnetically. I love using the pencil. Uh, because I write down all of my clearances, I write down all of my instructions, my finger makes it really sloppy, and I have a hard time reading it. Uh, when the pencil is charged and docked in there, I, it, it's perfect. It's just like no paper. I do have some paper and a pen in the airplane at all times, just in case, uh, but I never use them. I write everything down with a pen on my iPad. As I said, this is when I'm using the, the old iPad Pro. And uh, if you're thinking about iPads, I always buy them with the LTE and the... Um, GPS, I know you can get GPSs through Sentries and all kinds of other systems. Those are fantastic, um, but I kind of like having it integrated into the airplane. In the Cirrus, in a composite airplane, it's never lost signal. I can't say the same about necessarily aluminum airplanes. I haven't tried it, but I know that, that it, the GPS signal has always been fine here. 
Okay, uh, tonight's topic came from feedback on understanding your equipment requirements uh, because it's something that really can be confusing when you're looking at these charts. And you know, the one thing I tell people, even though the charting format's changing and the FAA is kind of organizing information into one box, still look at each of the points on the chart, uh, look at each of the fixes, ask yourself, how am I gonna identify this? That way you know you meet the requirements, you don't discover you're going missed and you can't identify the missed approach fix. Um, but to that tune, uh, for our next IFR Live two weeks from now, uh, let us know what you'd like, like us to talk about. We've got a link down in the description uh, to provide feedback. Again, that really helps us choose topics um, and kind of hone in on things that you're interested in. Uh, so you can provide feedback there. And then we have links to all of our courses as well. Uh, if you've been uh, watching several of these, you'll know they all come with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Um, and we offer full phone support. In fact, the phone number is in the course. Uh, believe it or not, there's an internet company that you can call on the phone. Uh, that's Bold Method. You might even talk to Colin. Um, <laughs> you never know. You never know. Uh, but again, uh, we really appreciate the feedback because it helps us really dial in and great topics that uh, people want to hear about. So thanks very much for joining in tonight. We hope to see you in two weeks for our next Bold Method Live VFR and IFR. Good night.